So today I'll be discussing, discussing um, electron density-based machine learning for accelerating quantum calculations, specifically in relation to um, heterogeneous catalysis. So what's the motivation? Why do we care about this? Um, so we have this thing in catalysis called the materials gap. And let me get a brief run through of what we do um, and how we predict um, materials properties. So we start off um, with relatively simple uh, surfaces when we're doing first, prin first principles quantum calculations. So we parameterize these physical models um, using quantum mechanics. So here you can see that we have current as a functional, as a generalized coordination number, and we can use this to find um, optimal types of sites and then infer from that optimal types of catalysts for accelerating catalyst design. So like I said, right now we can only really do this for simple materials. We only have the experimental techniques um, and analysis methods for interpreting results from um, simple materials. And so um, we are often left with these like just basic extended facets. Um, but in real industrial catalysts, we have complex materials. One, because we need to minimize the use of precious metals, and so we generate nanoparticles, we support them. And two, because we're at high temperatures and pressures. And so there's two parts of this materials gap. One is, um, I guess you could call it the computational materials gap and the fact that we can't compute quantum properties for these complex materials because it's just too many atoms. And the other is the temperature and pressure material gap in which we don't actually know what the materials look like under real temperature and pressure because um, the only methods that are out there right now for actually observing these materials are um, like microscopy, so like scanning tunneling microscopy. But you can really just get a really um, small view of that because they take a long time. And so it's not very statistically representative of your whole catalyst throughout your reactor. So then the question is, OK, how do we, from you know, experimental data that we have that can be statistically uh, representative of our, all our catalysts in our um, reactor that we're using, how can we infer from that what the actual structure looks like so that we can begin to perform quantum calculations and do predictions? And so to do this, we're going to need both physics and data science. And this is one of the, um, this is one of the uh, priority research directions um, issued by Department of Energy, which determines our funding, um, is combining these two techniques in order to understand dynamic changes, how those catalysts change under temperatures and pressures, um, as well as the static properties for complex materials. OK, so for catalysis, most of what is happening occurs on the surface. Um, and so infrared spectroscopy, which um, measures the um, energy it takes to transition from one vibrational state to another of absorbed materials, um, is ideal for this because it's surface selective. And so here you can see um, absorbance intensity as a function of frequency. So this is absorbed wavelength. Um, for carbon monoxide absorbed on platinum. And there's both one-on-one um, -on -one facets, extended surfaces, as well as platinum nanoparticles. And you can see how it, the um, concentration of the, of the nanoparticles given by um, the weight percent corresponds to differences in um, the spectra. Furthermore, IR spectra is also very, um, has very high spatial resolution, so you can get um, micrometer and actually nanometer spatial resolution, and also has very high time resolution and can be used operando, which means it can be done uh, during operating conditions, which is important. So why CO as a probe molecule? So historically, CO has been used in experiments to understand um, surfaces. And the reason for this is because it depends on binding type. So here you see the CO vibrating um, in what's called a threefold site. And you can see how the, the frequency um, of the, transition, of the uh, transition between the different vibrational states varies depending on the binding type. The other thing is that this CO frequency also depends on coordination number. So different um, absorption sites on different types of facets are coordinated to different um, uh, numbers of atoms, and that affects where that frequency is located, and they can use this to infer what kind of structure they have. So like I said, it depends on both site type and site coordination, and it also has these well-defined peaks. Now, typically in experiment, they're just using this single frequency, but there's actually six frequencies from CO. Um, but they just use a single one because when you're trying to identify um, it by I, which is what experimentalists do, um, it's easier just to have something simple like that. So currently, there's no quantitative methods 
um, to determine surface structure using vibrational spectra. Most of it's heuristic, and the reason is because we also need um, intensities, and I'll discover, discuss a little bit about that. So the goal of the work I've done thus far, and that's going to motivate my work on blue waters for this coming year, is to determine local microstructure, um, specifically platinum nanoparticles from experimental vibrational spectra. And this will be able to be applied to different kinds of absorbates on different kinds of materials, so not just platinum. So first, I'm going assess to assess the accuracy of DFT in recreating the IR spectra. I'm going to provide an overview of surrogate modeling that we, that we do to achieve this. I'll combine data science techniques with expert knowledge, so um, expert knowledge within our field to understand the data, and I'm going to highlight this using data visualization. Um, and then I'll illustrate some key details of the surrogate models before showing the model results on actual experimental applications. So um, before I showed you a scaling of the CO frequency against the coordination number, so on platinum 111, every platinum atom on the surface is coordinated to nine atoms. Um, in the bulk, it's coordinated to 12. You know, as you get more defected surface, that coordination number decreases. So here you see the CO frequency scales with um, what's called generalized coordination number, which we use because it uh, provides more accurate results. And it's just essentially it's just the weighted average of coordination number, taking both um, the first and second um, coordination spheres, right? So um, we use that. Um, so you can see it's a descriptor of local structure. But if we're trying to measure concentration, so the percent of occupied sites or the number of occupied sites, we also need intensities, right? Um, they correspond to each of the frequencies um, for CO absorbed at these different sites. So how do we compute intensities? Well, it's a function of the dynamic, dynamic dipole moment, um, which is essentially the shift in dipole um, as um, you shift along the normal mode coordinate for our vibration. And we can compute it um, basically by using the normal modes uh, and multiplying um, the normal mode vectors by the dipole Jacobian, which is what we do here. And these normal mode um, vectors we compute using a, st a standard Hessian of forces. Um, we use VASP for computing electron densities. And charge mole uh, we use to integrate over electron densities to get the dipoles. And that's going to be important in our future work. OK, so can we measure uh, spectra accurately? Can we compute it accurately from DFT? And in fact, we can. So here in green is the simulated spectra from DFT. Um, and in blue is experimental spectra um, measured using Atrial, so high resolution electron energy loss spectroscopy. And existing literature and theory supports the fact that frequencies can be measured um, accurately, as well as intensities, and actually much more accurately than energies themselves. Um, however, something you notice is there's not always a one to one correspondence between intensity and concentration. So, using a bunch of uh, expensive, time consuming experiment, experiment, experimental methods, um, for this system, which is a C4 by 2 overlayer on platinum, there's a quarter monolayer at the bridge position, so CO absorbed between two atoms. And um, quarter monolayer of CO absorbed at one atom, right? So you can see that um, the intensities can vary a lot um, based off how CO is absorbed. And there are more than um, just the frequencies we also, uh, of the CO stretch, which is here. We also have frequencies down here that correspond to platinum um, carbon monoxide stretches. And so we can use that information um, to better predict the absorption site from the spectra. So here's an overview of what we do. We begin with DFT data of um, C absorbed on single sites of different size nanoparticles, different sites of those nanoparticles, with different binding types and different coordinations. And we generate a large set, about 1,000 um, simple spectra. And so these spectra are actually just delta functions, because that's what you get from first principles. Um, and then we use uh, several physics-based surrogate models to approximate complex spectra because it's impossible to do it from DFT, it would just you know, take many, many lifetimes. Um, and I'll explain why in a little bit. And so we use um, physics-based models to remove outliers, um, use the harmonic approximation to compute um, the intensities, and then we um, um, use some scaling factors we developed to account for lateral interactions. So the fact that many CO are absorbed on many different kinds of sites will interact with each other, and that will affect the spectra. Um, we compute spectral mixing. So how do all these individual spectra combine? And finally, convolution um, to um, give it uh, basically to account for spectral broadening, um, which is typically Gaussian or Lorentzian. 
And finally, what we want to obtain from these spectra is the corresponding local structure, so basically a probability distribution function of occupied sites, right? So not just here's the average occupied site or here's what the predominant facet is, but what is the distribution? And from that, we can um, back calculate what the actual structures look like. So because real systems have many different nanoparticles, many different sizes with CO absorbing many different sites. And to do this, we need to use um, machine learning. So we use um, a neural network where the input are the intensities along the spectra, um, and then the output is basically this probability distribution function. Okay, so let me show you what we do with some data visualization of how we remove outliers. So here we have these outliers, and they're bad because when we're doing um, complex neural net networks like this where we're not just predicting a single value, but we're doing multinomial regression, um, you can get easily get stuck in local minima when you're training, um, and these outliers cause problems because they lead to very large gradients. In addition to the fact that there's just not enough data around them to predict them. So frequently, um, re researchers use statistical methods to remove outliers, but in chemistry, we, re we really want to include the physical outliers, because those are often the best catalysts. So um, by removing samples that aren't local minima on the potential energy surface after we apply a normal mode analysis, we can remove unphysical outliers and get cleaner looking data. So in green, um, these are CO bound to ATOP sites, so just single ATOP atoms. Um, blue is CO bound to two platinum atoms. Three is three-fold sites, obviously bound to three atoms. Four is CO bound to uh, four platinum atoms. This is the frequency and generalized coordination number. OK. So let me give you a little bit of information about this neural network. So um, basically, we have an input layer that corresponds to all the intensities. And so we discretize our spectra into 501 um, points. And then we have just two hidden layers. Um, well, that's for the binding type model. For the GCN model, we have four layers. Um, and um, then we have an output activation function, which gives us basically a probability distribution function, which represents the percent of CO that's absorbed at each kind of site. Now, um, because um, sites that have similar GCN values or ATOP and bridge sites versus threefold and fourfold sites are related to each other, um, there's what's called strong interclass relationships, meaning if I uh, have discretized my um, distribution from class 1 to 9, class 9 and class 8 are more similar to each other than class 9 and class 7. Um, and so we can't just use a log loss or a mean squared error as our loss function. Um, and the best thing that we can use is what's called Wasserstein squared. So Wasserstein loss measures the um, amount of mass, essentially, it takes to transport one distribution to another and um, basically compares the cumulative distribution functions of, of, of um, two distributions. Whereas KL divergence, which is what's typically used when you're doing multinomial regression, um, compares the distributions directly and so can't account for interclass relationships. So here's an example of what that means. And so we've implemented um, the first closed form solution of this, um, which will help us on, in future research. So here is basically the, the loss value. And here's parameter alpha, A, um, where we're comparing um, these three vectors to this vector, right? And so you can almost tell that this, um, you know, in, in yellow, this vector here is more similar to this based off the location of A, right? That seems pretty straightforward. A is further away from the fourth index here, and so green is always going to be further away. Well, the Washington loss can capture this difference, whereas KL divergence uh, and mean squared error just treat the loss between these three vectors and this vector um, the same regardless of the position of A in each index. OK, so I'm going to briefly just go through some results so that I can get to some future work. So here um, we have relative intensity uh, burst frequencies of um, some synthetic spectra, where this intensity corresponds um, to contributions from CO absorbed at ATOP sites. Um, this is threefold and fourfold sites, and this is bridge sites. And here we compare um, the actual absorption site distribution of that simulated spectra against um, our model prediction in purple. And so here are the different site types, and you can see very good agreement between the complex synthetic spectra um, and the um, uh, and what we predict. 
And so we do something similar for GCN, which takes into account um, the coordination of each site. So it's a little bit more detailed metric of the type of absorption site. And here again, in green, you have the, the actual GCN distribution of, um, this, of a, that simulated spectra. And here you have, in purple, you have the model prediction. And again, you get very good um, agreement. And so GCN is actually a continuous value. Um, it's this like average coordination. And so we need to dis discretize it. Um, and so to do that, we use an unsupervised uh, method we use um, to, to discretize it. And um, you can basically see the GCN values here in the GCN groups. So basically, we use k-means clustering, which gives us even amounts of data in each group. And so you want even amounts of data in each group with as evenly spaced groups as possible to extract the most information. OK, so how does this evaluate on actual experimental spectra? Um, can we get information? So here are some four examples of experimental spectra. So we have platinum uh, CO in that C4 by 2 configuration. So it's basically half a monolayer on platinum, where it's on both on atop and rich sites. And that's in green. And then in yellow, we have CO on platinum 110 in a single monolayer, one monolayer. That's pretty high coverage, all atop sites in yellow. Um, and then in blue, this is basically CO low coverage on a platinum 11 surface. And then in purple is uh, CO on platinum nanoparticles in a uh, sulfuric acid solution. And so this is what the spectra looks like, where you have intensity versus frequency. Um, and so here's some expert information, right? Because we want to evaluate you know, the performance of our model. We need to know ahead of time what the um, distribution of absorption sites are. And the whole reason we're building this model is because it's very difficult to do that. And so these are all relatively simple surfaces, which is why we can do that. But again, it takes highly specialized knowledge that very few groups have. Um, and so, for example, using low electron energy diffraction and temperature program desorption measurements that only specific labs have the knowledge to do, um, we confer that um, you know, that spectra corresponds to, like I said, C4 by 2, half monolayer configuration, where they're absorbed. And so at high pressures, you can get about 62% atop and 38% bridge. OK. So platinum 111, I'm not going to bore you with the details of the experiments, but um, all the CO should be at platinum and low coverage. So then on the 110 surface, one monolayer. Again, they used um, lead and TBD for this to, to get this type of structure. And then for the STM, basically, we can infer there's not going to be a high coverage on low index planes because um, we can actually calculate the amount of CO that's dissolved in the surface. And it's basically dissolved in a solution, and it's basically a small amount. OK, so how does it perform? So this is not comparing um, like actual histograms to our measured histograms. This is just the histogram for each, um, for each for C on each surface. And um, basically, we were able to get pretty good results that show that, for example, um, on our nanoparticle, um, there's no uh, CO at high coverage on these low index planes. Instead, it corresponds to CO and a platinum 110. And you see this sharp peak because those nanoparticles are very well designed, so very, um, very um, symmetric um, and, and all very similar. So um, I'm going to skip this so I can get to future work. But basically, we were able to identify absorption on specific types of sites that wasn't previously identified in literature um, using this machine learning method, um, which corresponds uh, to CO absorbed to actually in fourfold sites on platinum 110. Okay. So let me get to how we're going to um, extend this to blue waters. So I showed you that using quantum mechanics and simple surfaces, we get to these um, structure property relationships, right? But how do we get there? OK, so we get there using transition state theory, um, where we um, basically compute binding energies and um, get Gibbs energies of the transition state to go from a ground state uh, to the, an activated state. So we have these reactants, which are um, local minima on the potential energy surface. We have products, which are on local minima on the potential energy surface. So this is CO2, and this is CO and O separated, which you need if you want to do um, basically um, CO2, uh, you know, take CO2 out of the atmosphere. And here we have a saddle point, which corresponds to the transition state. So this is what this transition state looks like. And then we use this parameter to parameterize our models. And this is enthalpy. But like I showed you, what we actually care about is Gibbs energy, um, which includes vibrations that are used 
to compute what's uh, called entropy. Okay. So here, um, this kind of shows the computational complexity of calculating these different components. So we have order n to the, n to the third um, for the local minimum and the saddle point. Um, and it's ordered into the fourth for these vibrational calculations, which is why we need to use blue waters to address this problem. And so here's some future work I'm going to do. And thanks to my group. <laughs>